Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Garanger October 9th, St. Dionysius, Bishop and Martyr Ushered in by Bridget, the northern prophetess, Dionysius appears as the brightest star in that constellation of mystics, which illumines the close of the cycle with the first glimmers of eternal union. Soon we shall salute Teresa of Jesus and her guide Peter of Alcantara, while from the shades of his obscure night John of the Cross will rise in glory next month near to the great St. Gertrude. The man-god began to do and to teach, gave us first example, then doctrine. So too the Church in her liturgical year first sets before us the examples of the saints, and afterwards teaches us the rules of sanctity as formulated by these holy ones themselves. Strong in the results she has obtained, she now seems to rest in the security gained by experience, and, as in the proper of the time, of which that of the saints is the faithful echo, she yields to her desire of seeing her children able to comprehend, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth. To know also the charity of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that they may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Is not this the good work which the Apostle prays may be perfected in us by that last day, for which these weeks after Pentecost are preparing us, the perfect justice, the fruit of love in its full development? But this development of love cannot be without the progress of the soul in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that approving of better things of which St. Paul speaks can be acquired only by the imitation of the saints or the study of their works. Today the incomparable teacher Dionysius presides over the assembly of the faithful. With east and west let us keep silence, for it behooveth the master to speak and teach, and it beseemeth the disciple to hold his peace and listen. Every best gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every emanation of splendor overflowing from the divine goodness upon man reacts in him as a principle of spiritual simplification and of heavenly union, and by its own power leads him back towards the sovereign unity and godlike simplicity of the Father. For all things come from God and return to God. By the very fact that they exist, inanimate objects partake of God, who, by the sublimity of his essence, is the being of all that is. Living things partake of his vital energy, which is superior to all life. Rational and intellectual creatures partake of his wisdom, which surpasses all reason and intelligence. The various beings approach nearer to the divinity, in proportion as they partake of it in more ways. It is a general law that divine graces are communicated to the lower orders through the ministry of the higher. The indivisible trinity who possesses divinity by nature, has established the hierarchy of the deification of all beings, whether rational or purely spiritual. For salvation is possible only to deified spirits. As deification is nothing else but the attainment of union with God and resemblance to Him, the aim of the hierarchy is to assimilate and unite to God, first of all by the absolute retrenchment of all that is contrary to His love, then by the knowledge of sacred truths, by the participation in the simplicity of him who is one, and by the nuptial banquet of the vision. The order of all hierarchy is therefore this, that some should be purified, and others should purify, that some should be enlightened, and others should enlighten, that some should be perfected, and others should work that perfection. Every function it imposes tends to the twofold end of receiving and of giving purity, light, and perfect holiness. The first hierarchy of blessed spirits receives the first influx of the virtues of Jesus, the supreme initiator, and imitates him in the highest manner. This first hierarchy is obeyed by the second, the second by the third, and the third by the hierarchy of men. And thus by a divine harmony they rise, one by means of another, towards him who is the beginning and the end of all beautiful order. As each hierarchy includes powers of three different ranks, the same wonderful harmony exists between these several ranks. 
Moreover, in every intelligence, human or angelic, are to be found faculties corresponding to the three orders of each hierarchy. It is by passing through these successive degrees that spirits partake according to their capacity of purity, light, and unlimited perfection. For nothing is perfect in itself. Nothing is incapable of further progress, save him who is the primitive and infinite perfection. The blessed inhabitants of heaven, who have nothing sensible or corporeal, God attracts and raises to divine things, not by exterior means. He causes the pure rays and intelligible splendors of his adorable will to shine within them. What is thus imparted to them directly, and in unity, is transmitted to us, as it were, fragments, under the multiplicity of varied symbols, in the Holy Scripture, in the figures wherein our hierarchy, adapting itself to human nature, shrouds for us the mystery of divine regeneration, and of all the other holy mysteries, and again in the harmony of the universe, which shows forth the images and footprints of divine ideas. Though all things speak of God to man, not one of them speaks aright. God is accessible to the understanding, to reason, to science. He is discerned by the sensibility, by thought, by the imagination. In a word, he can be named. Nevertheless, he is incomprehensible, ineffable, nameless. Everything reveals him to all men, and yet nothing manifests him to anyone. Everything may be predicted of him as being the universal cause, but as he is beyond all expression, everything may be more truly denied of him. Hence many in their progress towards God are not content with passing beyond the starting point of exterior senses necessary to our nature, but rise beyond the manifold operations of reasoning and argumentation. As the senses are a hindrance, when the soul applies herself to intelligible things by the pure understanding, so the intellectual faculty itself becomes useless when the divinized soul, sublimely ignorant, forgetful of all things, plunges herself into the abyss of unfathomable wisdom. The simple adhesion of the angelic natures to him, who surpasses all knowledge, has become the property of these souls. Emulating the angels, they have attained the aim of all hierarchy, by becoming as entirely as possible united with God. Guide of Christians in sacred wisdom, O Trinity, sovereignly good, lead us to that height, where all light is outshone by a darkness which coruscates in brilliant lightnings, and though it can neither be seen nor grasped, inundates with the beauty of its fires the blessedly blinded spirits. The account given by Rome of St. Dionysius and his companions is the same as that in the Menea of the Greek Church, though the latter keeps their feast on October 3rd. Dionysius, an Athenian, was one of the judges of the Areopagus, and a man learned in every science. It is related of him that on the day Christ our Lord was crucified, he, though still a pagan, on perceiving the unnatural eclipse of the sun, cried out, Either the God of nature is suffering, or the world is coming to an end. Paul the Apostle, coming to Athens, was brought before the Areopagus to give an account of the doctrine he preached. He there proclaimed that Christ our Lord had risen from the tomb, and that the dead would all live again. Many thereupon believed in Christ, and among them Dionysius. He was baptized by St. Paul, and appointed to govern the Church of Athens. Later on he came to Rome, whence Pope Clement sent him to preach the gospel in Gaul. Rusticus, a priest, and Eleutherius, a deacon, accompanied him as far as Paris. As he converted many in that town to Christianity, Phasenius, the prefect, commanded him and his companions to be beaten with rods. But continuing to preach the faith as zealously as before, they were placed on hot gridirons and suffered several other tortures. They endured the torments bravely and joyfully. Finally, Dionysius, who was a hundred and one years old, was beheaded with his companions on the 7th of the Ides of October. It is related of Dionysius that after his decapitation, he took up his head and carried it in his hands for two miles. He wrote some wonderful and truly heavenly books on the divine names, on the celestial and the ecclesiastical hierarchy, 
on mystical theology, and several others. Honor to thee on this day of thy triumph. Honor to the apostle of the Gentiles, who comes to meet thee as his noble conquest on the threshold of eternity. From early youth how thy soul yearned for that unknown God, whom the apostle at length revealed to the longing aspirations of thy grand, upright nature. To the darkness of polytheism, to the doubts of philosophy, to the vague glimmers of confused traditions, suddenly succeeded the light of truth, and its triumph was complete. Thou, O Christian Plato, didst enlarge the horizon of philosophy, and didst so rectify its formulas that in them truth could be fittingly clothed. Thou, in thy turn, didst become an apostle. The distinction of Greek and barbarian, that law of the ancient world, was lost in the common origin assigned by St. Paul to all peoples. To the eyes of thy faith, slaves and freemen were equal in that nobility which makes the human race the race of God, while the charity which overflowed in thy heart filled it with the immense pity of God himself for the long ages of ignorance in which mankind had been plunged. Thus in thy zeal, obeying the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, thou, like a cloud laden with the blessings of the Lord, didst bring fertility to the far west. The people of Gaul learned from thee to seek God, to find him, and to live in him, and this new church had no reason to envy the earlier ones, built on the foundations of prophets and apostles. O chosen stone, good for the foundations, so intimately united to the cornerstone, that every construction thou upholdest becomes a holy temple of the Lord. The church of France built upon thee is also the house of God. O Dionysius, quicken again the divine seed thou didst sow. Restore to Paris and to France their traditions, now forgotten in the fever of gain and pleasure. Bring back Athens to the communication of Christ's vicar, the indispensable condition of union with our Lord. For every church under heaven obtain such pastors as thou didst describe in the following lines which reveal thyself. By the holy love which draws us to him, Jesus calms the tempest of distracting cares, and recalling our souls to the unity of the divine life, he confirms us in the permanent fruitfulness of this noble ministry. Soon, by the exercise of the sacred functions, we draw nigh to the angels, striving to set ourselves, like them, in the fixed state of unchangeable holiness. Thence, gazing upon the divine splendors of the blessed Jesus, and enriched with the profound knowledge of mystical contemplation, we become fitted to be ourselves consecrated, in order that we may consecrate, to receive light in order to communicate it, to become perfect in order to lead others to perfection.